Okay, uh, we'll let, uh, let everybody into the webinar. Uh, welcome to Powerhouse Arena's virtual events. Uh, my name is Chris, I'm the events coordinator. And tonight we're very proud to be hosting the launch of Roy's World by Barry Gifford. It'll be in conversation with Willie Vaughton. Uh, you can buy copies of the book at powerhousebookstores.com. Uh, the link is in the event page and I'll, I'll post it in the chat. If you have any questions, you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and uh, Barry can take questions at the end of the event. Uh, and I'll introduce our speakers now. Willie Vaughn has published five novels, The Motel Life, Northline, Lean on Pete, The Free and Don't Skip Out on Me. Uh, the Motel Life has turned into a major motion picture starring Chris Christopherson and Emile Hirsch in 2012. And the movie version of Lean on Pete was released in 2018 starring Charlie Plummer and Steve Buscemi. Fountain lives outside of Portland, Oregon and is the founding member of the bands Richmond Fontaine and the Delines. Barry Gifford is the author of more than 40 published works of fiction, nonfiction, and poetry, which have been translated into 30 languages. His most recent books include The Cuban Club, The Up Down, Writers, Sailor and Lula, The Complete Novels, and Landscape with Traveler. He co-wrote with David Lynch the screenplays for the two movies they made together, Lost Highway and Wild at Heart, which won the Palme d'Or at Cannes. Gifford lives in the San Francisco Bay Area. And uh, before we get started, I'm going to uh, share uh, the trailer for the new uh, namesake documentary. So give me one second here as I pull that up. Chicago, a city of beauty, strength, and power. Chicago, commercial capital of the nation, agricultural market and industrial center of the world. Chicago, the most American of American cities. Everything was related to Chicago. That cynical kind of attitude, kind of a toughness. And Chicago was a great place. Many years ago, when I first started writing, you know, thinking about the history of the place and people and language. I said, I just want to remember the time that I had with my mother. And so I created Roy and his mother. A lot of it is based on things that more or less happened, but much of it not. When he and his mother flew up from Miami and arrived in Chicago during the dead of winter, he decided this was a lie. Hell was cold, not hot, and he was horrified that his mother had delivered him to such a place. Standing halfway down the block were two girls, both wearing black scarves around their heads, navy blue pea coats, short black skirts with black tights, and black fruit boots. One of them is smoking a cigarette. Bad girls, said Roy. I hope so, said Jimmy Boyle. What I feel that I'm doing, and have been doing, was recording history of that particular time and place, mostly the 50s and early 60s, 
mostly in Chicago, and that's Roy's World. I can see you. Okay, cool. Hey, um, um, well, I first want to say, uh, just tell you a little bit about how I got to know Barry. I was 20 years old and just had fallen in love with writing novels. And I was, uh, I went to the library in Reno, Nevada. And on the, on the main release, the new release thing, uh, case said a novel called Wild at Heart. And I took it down, I looked at it, and then I opened the first page and it said, uh, a quote by Tuesday Weld. And it said, you need a man to go to hell with. And I automatically said, well, I gotta check this book out. And I read it and I reread it. And it was, it was uh, not a life changing moment or anything, but I was just like, oh my God, I didn't know you could write like this. And ever since then, I'd go, when I went to a bookstore, the very first section I'd go was to the G's and I'd look for Leonard Gardner to see if he ever wrote another book beside Fat City. And then I'd go to look for Barry Gifford who always, uh, and as a lucky thing as a fan, he'd always have a new book. It seemed like every time I went to the bookstore, there'd be a new Barry Gifford and they were always top notch. So I was just a fan. And then 25 years later, uh, I met him, in Mallorca, Spain, which is uh, the craziest thing to me because I, I barely even knew where Spain was when I was 20 and I, I didn't have a passport till I was 37. Uh, and then in an airport, I see Barry Gifford and I ran up to him and like, Jesus, are you Barry Gifford? And, uh, and so that's how we met and we became pals. And so I'm very happy uh, to be here and to celebrate uh, Roy's stories with him. So it's great to see your face, Barry. Oh, Willie, you're a darling. You know something, it's, it's fun even, you know, seeing that trailer because I do like this documentary a lot. I was very surprised by it, in fact. I was surprised that I did like it and that the director, Rob Christopher, was able to pull it off and make a movie about Roy and not necessarily about Barry Gifford. He made a movie about what I created rather than just my own life, which is exactly what you know, my desire was about it to participate. But the soundtrack, Willie, and Willie, everybody should know that Willie, of course, is a great musician. Now he has a band called the D-Lines, which is one of my favorite music groups in the world. And uh, Jason Adashowitz, who did that, you know, as a jazz musician, you know, created that soundtrack. Uh, it's really brilliant. And they are gonna bring that soundtrack out uh, you know, as a CD streaming, you know, some kind of techno, you know, gadget, whatever is current, that kind of thing. But that's a really beautiful part of the documentary is the music. So you How, did you, meet, how did you meet Rob Christopher? And, and, and why didn't you want it to be a talking head uh, where you were more a part of it? Well, because, I mean, I am a part of it, certainly. It's all about, you know, the characters basically, and I do talk and, you know, Matt and Willem and Lily read the stories and that kind of thing. But um, I had a couple of documentaries made about me before in Italy, uh, which is a feature documentary and also in France, which is a feature doc, you know, and it was typical, you know, talking heads, that kind of thing. And I, they were good. I liked it. They were entertaining. And, um, but I, I just, I, I don't know, that kind of stuff bores me. I don't want to have people sitting around analyzing me or the, the books and what's the difference between the author and his work and that kind. I just don't want to hear any of that academic nonsense. So when I said this to Rob, I said, okay, when he approached me about doing uh, this because he was a filmmaker, he made one feature film, uh, fiction film, and I said, okay, as long as you can, you know, do it about Roy. And, you know, since Rob lives in Chicago 
and was an editor at a magazine called The Chicagoist, which is how I first met him to answer your question, because The Chicagoist started publishing the Roy stories. Um, and Rob was my editor there. Uh, basically, that's, that's what he did. He was able to pull it off. I still don't know how he did it. Yeah, it's brilliant. I, I was lucky enough to see it. And I think you can find more about it, I think, on uh, roysworldfilm.com. Uh, how to, I think that's the right uh, Yeah, I ad. think it is. It's playing, it's playing in festivals now, you know. Yeah. And, and so because of the pandemic, so many of these things have been canceled that it's, it's difficult. But uh, it's streaming in some place or another. Hey, uh, before we get talking about Roy, I wanted to ask you one question that I've never asked you, which is the illustrations. It seemed to me that, and I'm gonna find one right here. Where are you, illustration? There it is right there. Um, it seemed like when you started Roy, and I could be totally wrong about this, but it seemed like I started noticing um, your illustrations, maybe with your book, Writers. Um, the most is when I just started seeing your illustrations and now that I find them in Roy. Uh, have you always drawn and uh, what made you start putting illustrations in your books? I wanted people to see what the characters look like. And the characters just came straight out of my mind. Yeah, I started drawing when I was a kid and I used to replicate, uh, you know, comic book characters, sports figures, and, you know, just really with a notebook, like I write now, you know, I'm writing in a foreign language, right? Which is cursive. So, so people under the age of 35, I suppose, in there don't write cursive and can't read it. So I realized since I write in longhand, and actually I'm writing a, a new Roy book now called The Boy Who Ran Away to Sea, which is full of my drawings. Uh, because I started it in a book called Sad Stories of the Death of Kings because I wanted people to see some of these characters and the publisher went along with it. And uh, I didn't draw, I didn't do any artwork for a long time. And then in recent years, I started again. And it was fact, in fact, it was Matt Dillon that got me back into it. And he liked my drawings and some other people did too. And so I started selling them through a gallery um, you know, or giving them away a gallery in San Francisco. And uh, now they're in shows all over the world. It's really, it's really kind of amazing. So that's the main purpose really, which was since I was able to do it and the publisher was tolerant enough to, you know, in, include the drawings, then people get an idea of, of who the characters are and they inform the stories. That's the important thing because the expressions on the people, the way they look, um, the movement of the characters, which I like to, because I always see these characters moving, even you know, in the drawings, which of course seems absurd because they're just black and white still drawings. Um, they, and especially in the new book that's coming, I really feel they're part of each chapter or each story because you know, Roy's world really is a novel. It's sort of never ending at this point. I, for people that don't know or, or are just jumping into Roy's world, uh, um, the stories in this collection are as early as 1973. Um, but uh, for, for a lot of people, uh, you're, you spent years in, in, in a kind of a gothic southern world of Sailor and Lula, and as you said, among the white trash and poor blacks and Latinos of the South. And there's satire and humor, and it often feels to me like you've been transported into a different reality, with violence and freaks and oddities and always romance. And you have a ton of novels from this era, but because you're the man, and I have to do this because you're the man with the best titles of, of any writer I've met, I'm gonna just list a few of them, which is Wild at Heart, Sailor's Holiday, 59 Degrees and Raining, Night People, Arise and Walk, Baby Cat Face, Sultans of Africa, Consuelo's Kiss, and the Sinaloa Story. I mean, I don't know how you come up with so many great titles. But then I remember going to a bookstore, same thing under G, I find Wyoming. And I didn't know at that point you'd written many stories about Roy. And all of a sudden there, there seemed to be a shift 
Now you continued to write in the in the world of Sailor and Lula, and uh, um, but there was a shift to Roy. What what made that shift? It felt for a fan, it felt sudden, but it probably wasn't. They were the first stories, really, that I ever wrote. I began when I was about 11 years old and I started writing stories and a lot of them were funny, you know, and uh, I was just writing the stories off the top of my head. I mean, it's all, you know, what is fiction? It means you made it up. And so, of course, I was basing it on some incidents that took place in my life, but some things that were absolutely not connected to my life at all. And then an older brother, of a friend of mine, of a very close friend of mine, uh, picked up, you know, some of these stories that I had written and given to my friend, uh, Magic Frank in Chicago. And he said, man, I never read stories like this before. There's a lot of weird shit going on in here. He says, where do you come up with these people and these names for the characters? Because even then the names were bizarre. And, you know, I had no real answer for him. I'm not very, self-analytical as it were. You know, I'm not an academic. I, nobody taught me to write. I didn't go to college, you know, and, you know, I'm just, uh, just off the boat, man. You know, I always feel like that, you know, and that, you know, tomorrow I can turn around and step onto another boat. So I like Will you that. take me with me? Yeah, I like that kind <laughs> of freedom. You know, I like that kind of freedom, but really to answer the question, that's when I began. And so, the first Roy stories, actually, that I published uh, uh, were in 1973 in a book called A Boy's Novel. And it was the same thing as the Roy stories. It was just an early title of a short, rather short book. I don't know, maybe 100 pages long. And uh, then I went on from there. And so really, it's a half century of writing the Roy stories. And I'm still writing them. You know, Roy still has a, you know, it's really a history of a time and place that no longer exists. And when you talk about the Sailor and Lula novels, of which there are now eight, and they're all collected in one volume now, uh, I grew up half in the deep south and half in the far north, as I say, in Chicago. But when I was a little kid, we lived in Key West, Florida, and my friends were all the, you know, Cuban street kids, because it was a Cuban neighborhood. That's where I learned my Cuban kid street Spanish that I still speak. And, uh, you know, so I grew up in that milieu and then the family headquarters were in Chicago. So we would go up to Chicago. My father lived there and he had an apartment in the Hotel Nacional in Havana. So we would go there. So it was basically, you know, a peripatetic kind of childhood. We lived in hotels, my mother and I. And my parents were divorced when I was uh, barely five years old. And so we lived in hotels in Key West, Miami, New Orleans, uh, Jackson, Mississippi, Chicago, uh, wherever we went. Wyoming uh, is a novel that I wanted to write a novel where there was no description. And that any kind of description came through uh, the dialogue between the mother and her son Roy, who's about nine years old, eight or nine years old, in the whole novel. So the whole novel is just dialogue. It's the two of them talking about their lives, uh, making observations wherever they are, that kind of thing. And it was turned into a play as well that the Magic Theater did in San Francisco. It was rather beautiful to see it, and I'm glad my mother got to see it before she died. And, you know, it, it, it hit her right where I wanted it to hit. And, you know, it, it just one of the most satisfying things I did. But Wyoming, even though it's a novel, a standalone novel, and it was published that way and sold that way, it really was part of the Roy stories. And so it's included in Roy's world, in the book Roy's world. Hey, would you be up for uh, reading one, uh, as a Roy story? Just to give people a, a, an idea of it? You want a short one or a long Oh one? man, for me, you could read them all night long. You know, I'm really, well, I can read the one, do you know the story Acapulco? It's kind of long, it's, it's in, uh, 
it might be too long to do in the, in the short time we have here. And basically, I've been lately writing, uh, as you know, these news stories. Oh, I know what I'll read. So here's what hey, I'm going to Al Capone, well, I'll ask you about Al Capone later because I want to hear about Uncle Buck, but read, read oh, well, what you're I'll read that one later. Let me read one that, that takes place in Cuba. Okay, it's called La Sorpresa, which means the surprise. Roy's father had been in Havana for a week before Roy and his mother arrived. Roy liked Cuba, having gone there for the first time the year before. Now he was about to celebrate his sixth birthday at Los Siete Pecados, La Habana's most famous nightclub. His father was friends with the owners, one of whom, Martin Finura, a short, middle-aged, large-breasted, pancake-makeup-laden woman with architecturally challenging high-piled raven black hair, greeted Roy with a hug and a lipstick-smearing kiss and told him the night was his, that he could order whatever he wanted to eat or drink, with the exception of alcohol, of course. It was 8.30 when he and his father entered the club. Rudy, where is your beautiful wife, Esther Noche? Martin asked. She is coming later for when we have the birthday sorpresa. Kitty's not feeling well, Martin. She won't be coming, but told me to give you her best wishes, como siempre. Perhaps you'll see her before she and Roy return to Cajueso. They're staying with me at the Nacional. Roy's parents were divorced, but remained on good terms, and Rudy continued to support Kitty and their son financially. Kitty's fragile health required that she reside in a temperate climate and avoid unnecessary aggravation. So she chose for the time being to live in Key West, Florida, rather than in Chicago, where Roy was born and Rudy maintained his headquarters and primary home. His business interests took him on a regular basis to Las Vegas, New York, New Orleans, Havana, and elsewhere. Roy missed seeing his father more frequently, but Rudy kept in close touch by phone, and when they were together, they always had a good time. Roy enjoyed meeting the wide variety of people to whom his father introduced him, though he seldom understood what their professions were. As the premier nightclub in Havana, Los Siete Pecados showcased the most glamorous and best dancers along with the finest orchestra and entertainers, such as Perez Prado, Benny Moray, and Americanos, Nat King Cole, Frank Sinatra, Louis Armstrong, and others. Attached to the club and restaurant was an annex that housed the casino and bar that stayed open 24 hours and never closed, even on religious holidays. On this particular night, Roy was doubtless the only six-year-old present. Once the floor show began, his father told him he had to go talk to some people and that he would be back soon. Martin Finura escorted Roy to a table in front of the stage and sat down next to him. Roy ordered a cheeseburger, an iced Coca-Cola, and a chimney-sized glass. After he'd finished eating and there was a break in the entertainment, the orchestra played Happy Birthday and a voluptuous showgirl wearing a dazzling, glass diamond decorated headdress and a skimpy costume brought to the table a large cake with seven lit candles on it. Una para que traiga buena suerte, she whispered loudly in Roy's right ear. Martin told him to make un deseo grande and then blow out the candles, which he did with one breath. The showgirl gave Roy kisses on both cheeks and the other patrons sang along with the orchestra and then applauded. Roy asked the showgirl what her name was, and she said, I am called La Hija de la Noche, but now that you and I are friends, you may call me Lavinia. I hope you're still here when I'm older, Roy said. And she and Martin laughed. Lavinia kissed him again, this time on the lips, and then she was gone. The orchestra began to play Take Me Out to the Ball Game, and Sebastiano El Furioso Segura the star center fielder for the Havana Sugar Kings professional baseball team, came to Roy's table carrying a big box. The orchestra leader announced over the microphone that Segura was presenting un gran regalo to Roy, a Sugar Kings uniform with the number six and Roy's name on the back of the jersey. Martin helped Roy open the box and together they removed the uniform and held it up for the audience to see. 
Sebastiano Segura placed a black cap with a white capital letter H above the bill on Roy's head and shook his hand. People in the crowd shouted, Arriba, Arriba, and Roy stood up on his chair next to Segura, who wrapped his left arm around his shoulders and waved to everyone. The band broke from the baseball song into Siboné, and the patrons returned their attention to the stage. Sebastiano Segura again shook hands with Roy. The ball player, who, was a few year, who a few years before had played for the Pittsburgh Pirates in the major leagues, but was subsequently banned for gambling and conspiring to throw games, said to Roy, remember, Hijo, the next best thing to playing and winning is playing and losing. He laughed and exchanged besitos with Martin Kinura, waved once more, and left the club. Feliz cumpleaños, Chico, Martin said. How do you like your presa? Thank you, Senora, Roy said. I've never had a real baseball uniform before. He looked around the room. I wish my dad had been here to meet Sebastiano Segura and see my gift. Do you know where he is? Martin stood up. Stay here, Roy. I will find him. She signaled to a waiter to come over and ordered him to bring Roy another Coca-Cola. Roy sat holding the Sugar King's uniform and watched the dancers. Lavinia was in the center, in front of the others, kicking the highest. After a few minutes, a singer came on stage and the audience applauded wildly. Roy suddenly felt sleepy and rested his head on the table. He awoke as his father was carrying him to his car and laying him down gently on the back seat. A man Roy had never seen before was standing next to the car, holding the box the uniform had come in. Put it into the trunk, Rudy told him. Rudy closed the rear door on the passenger side, then walked around the front of the car, got into the driver's seat and started the engine. He turned his head and looked at Roy. I bet you'll never forget this birthday, he said. Thank you, Barry. Hey, uh, interesting. Uh, last night I read Role Model, uh, which is interesting and in, because there's a huge shift in Roy's life when he's when his father's alive um there's travel and uh, hotels and uh, Key West and Havana Cuba and and it's full of romance I guess and then when he lands in Chicago with his mother like like it says in the trailer of the documentary uh you know he thought it was hell and so there's a huge shift afterwards. And, and Role Model is a really interesting story because it shows, I forget how old, uh, maybe his 14th birthday, uh, a completely different birthday where he comes home on his birthday, doesn't tell his friends, doesn't tell anybody he works with that it's his birthday. Um, his mom knows it's his birthday, but he's only home for a short time because he has to go run out and, and work as a short order cook. And uh, when he comes home, uh, his mother has a, left him a cake, but, but there's no one there. Um, so it seems like what I find so interesting in the arc of Roy's stories is, is you start uh, as you do a boy, and it's, it's a really romantic world. Uh, and, then, and then it becomes, as we all do, you kind of get uh, a loss of, re, of innocence. Uh, and, and, and I think what's so great about this collection is it shows the whole arc of, of an adolescence. The story I read before, La Sopresa, it's not in the Roy, Roy's world. It's, it's part of my new book, and I'm closest to those stories now, so that's why I read it, but it's a Roy oh, story. Oh, you sent me that one, and that's why I thought it was, because I've, I've heard that story before. Okay. Right. It, in any case, uh, yeah, Role Model has sort of been singled out. as you, Maybe I should read that, because it's just a couple of pages long. Should I read it? Oh, I think you should, because it's a great... It, it's a great one with uh because it's, it's a good page. introduction it also takes place in chicago so it's more apropos uh you know regarding the film too and it's on Roll 645 model. yeah i got it Roll model. i actually have a book here <laughs> me they too. finally got one to me um role model on roy's fourth this these are birthday stories roy birthday stories you're right on Roy's 14th birthday, he came home from school and found his mother sitting alone at the kitchen table, drinking a cup of coffee and reading Holiday Magazine. Hi, Ma, he said. What are you reading? An article about Brazil. You know, I was there once. 
You told me. Who were you there with? Oh, a boyfriend. It was before I met your father. We spent a week in Rio. The beaches were lovely. The sand was so white, but very crowded, as crowded as Times Square on New Year's Eve. The Carioca girls were almost naked, brown and slithery and beautiful. I had a wonderful time. Why haven't you gone, ever gone back? Rio's not the kind of place your father would have liked. And since he died, I've not had the opportunity. It was a dreary day, drizzly and gray and colder than usual for the time of year. Roy knew his mother preferred warm weather. It's my birthday today. I know, Roy. Are you going out with your friends? Later, maybe. Right now I'm going to work. I just came home to change my clothes. Your father always dressed well. People used to dress better in the old days. You mean in the 1940s? Yes, before then too. Well, I'm gonna be boiling hot dogs and frying hamburgers. It wouldn't be a good idea for me to wear a suit. No, Roy, of course not. That's not what I mean. It's just that people cared more for their appearance when I was young. This is 1961, Ma, and you're only 34. You're still young. Roy was standing next to the table. His mother looked up at him and smiled. She really is still beautiful, he thought. She had long auburn hair, dark brown eyes, perfect teeth, and very red lips. I know you miss your father, Roy. It's a shame he died so young. He was a strong person, Roy said. People liked and respected him, didn't they? Yes. He handled things his own way. People trusted him. You know, your father never gave me more than $25 a week spending money but I could go into any department store or good restaurant and charge whatever I wanted. I'll tell you something that happened not long after he and I were married. We were living in the Seneca Hotel where you were born, and there was another couple in the hotel we were friends with, Ricky and Rosita Danilo. Rosita was a little older than I. She was from Puerto Rico, and Ricky was a few years younger than your dad, who was 19 years older than me. What business was Ricky in? Oh, the rackets, like everybody in Chicago. But he wasn't in your father's league. He looked up to Rudy. Anyway, late one afternoon, your father came home and I was wearing a new hat. I was wearing a new hat, blood red with a veil. And he said it looked good on me. I told him I was just trying it on. He asked me where I'd gotten it. And I said it was a gift from Ricky Daniel that I'd come back to the hotel after having lunch with Peggy Spain and the concierge handed me a hat box with a note from Ricky. What did he say? What did the note say? I don't remember exactly. Something about how he hoped I'd like it, that when he saw it in the shop window, he thought it, it suited my style. Your dad didn't say anything. But the next day, when I went down to the lobby, I saw that one of the plate glass windows in the front was boarded up. I asked the concierge what happened. And he told me that Rudy had punched Ricky Danilo and knocked him through the window. Then told the hotel manager to put the cost of replacing it on his bill. That night I said to your dad, you knocked Ricky through a plate glass window just because he bought me a hat? What did he say? No, Kitty. I did it because he didn't ask me first. That's the kind of guy your father was. I didn't say another word about it. What happened to the hat? I never wore it. I gave it away to someone. Roy did not tell anyone at work that it was his birthday and afterwards he was too tired to go anywhere. When he got home, there was a chocolate cake on the kitchen table with 15 yellow candles stuck in it. His mother was, wasn't home. He picked up a book of matches that was on the stove and lit the candles then took off his wet jacket and draped it over the back of the chair. Roy thought about making a wish, but he couldn't think of one. He blew out the candles anyway. Oh, that was great, Barry, thank you. Um, well, for anyone who hasn't read uh, Roy's World, it's, it's, it's a big book. It, there's 200, at least I counted, I'm not very good at counting, but uh, 228 in the collection. And what I found in rereading them is, is, is once you get into it, it's, there's a rhythm to them. It's like a, you're, 
like each little story is a brick and you're building the world until, until you get this full world of both sh uh, uh, Chicago and, a, uh, and like we said earlier, a, a more romantic life uh, with, with his father uh, and, and more of like high end gangster living. Um, but my first question that I wanted to ask that I've never asked you is what's your relationship to Chicago now? I mean, you, you, you write about all about a Chicago when you were a kid, but do you go back there now or what's your, what's your, you know, relationship with the city now? I have no interest in ice and snow. And <laughs> when I was 17 years old and I graduated high school, I said, that's it. I'm leaving. You know, I don't want to live anywhere anymore that has weather like this, you know, with the wind and uh, Chicago's famous, of course, for its bad weather and it's too hot in the summer and, the, you know, that sort of thing. But no, I, you know, I left Chicago when I was 17 and except for a couple of, you know, brief visits, I haven't really been back. I mean, Chicago was a great place for me to grow up in and to have that Northern side of myself developed. And the music was what excited me the most because I began as a musician and I used to go down to the South and West sides of the blues clubs and became friends and acquainted with a number of the musicians. Magic Sam was the guy who taught me first how to play the guitar at the old Alex Club on Roosevelt Road when I was 15. And, you know, that's what happened. And out of the song lyrics grew the poems and out of the poetry grew the fiction. So it really was a way to kick things off, but it was a hard place, you know? And uh, my mother had a, a checkered life. I mean, she lived to be very old. She was 91 when she died. She was married five times in her lifetime. I supported her for the last 35 years of her life, uh, my sister and I. And uh, it was a difficult time for her. She had been the University of Texas beauty queen in 1944, and then a model in New York, and then in Chicago at the Merchandise Mart where she met my dad. And my dad was involved in organized crime. And like uh, Roy's father, you know, she was 20 years uh, older than my father. And he died when I was barely 12. So basically I've been on my own since I was 11. I went to work when I was 11, you know, delivering Chinese food on a bicycle for 25 cents an hour and a dime of delivery. Uh, you well, there's know, a, there's a really then, interesting, oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. That, that, that's oh, there was I'm just really... It... I'm, I'm trying to get into the Chicago part of it. And so for those years, really, I mean, Chicago, uh, you know, I learned the lesson, man. I mean, every day you learn a lesson in Chicago. And I grew up in this, you know, middle, uh, how can I say this? It's a working class neighborhood. It was mostly Irish when we first lived there. And, uh, you know, it was a blue collar neighborhood you know, St. Tim's Parish. And so, you know, street life was what was important. I mean, I didn't have any parental guidance, as Sailor says, you know, and wild at heart. Um, the, the, sorry to interrupt, what I, but what I was gonna say uh, fit in with that, which is, and I think uh, in Roy's letter to his dad, um, he says, by the time I was 11, I understood that it was up to me to take care of myself. At 11 years old, that's a pretty early time to, to make that realization. Um, how, how did you come to that realization? I mean, uh, were you scared by it or traumatized by it? It doesn't, it doesn't feel like that in Roy. And I'll tell you why I asked that in a, in a sec. It was just a natural thing to do. Uh, by that time, my father, you know, was very ill. My father died. He helped support my mother, even though she married, gosh, uh, two more times or three more, two or three more times while he was still alive. And, uh, but then all of a sudden we didn't have any money. And after an early life where, you know, we lived in nice hotels basically, and where I heard stories from everybody, you know, tourists or, you know, people stay, staying in the hotels from all over the world. I had this really expansive life, you know, and, you know, a very different kind of thing. But all of a sudden there we were, my sister was an infant. Uh, that marriage, uh, my mother's dissolved. So she had to get a job, which she did as a receptionist in a private hospital. And I had to go to work. 
So, in fact, all during high school, I gave my mother money. You know, I, I'm not pleading my case here. I'm just saying it was something that you have to do. 11 years old is young, yes, for some people. But uh, others start, you know, when they're four or five. So it just depends where you are, where you are in the world, what your circumstances are. You know, that's all. So it just seemed like a natural thing to do. And I had to make, you know, my own money. But like I say, I had my mother and my sister to help take care of as well. There wasn't any income coming from anywhere else. Unlike, a, you know, a lot of people I got to know and that sort of thing. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I was just remembering I had the same, I had the same epiphany in a different way when I was 11. I remember mm -hmm. walking along a, an irrigation ditch uh, with my dog trying to figure out how I could get enough money to move into a motel. Cause I knew, cause right. Reno had all these motels and, and I didn't understand how you hook up electric or plumbing. I mean, or, you know, get gas and pay your bills. But I knew if you handed a guy money at, a, at the counter at a motel, he gave you a, a, a house, basically a room with a TV and a bed. But I was more, but I, I couldn't get on with it. It was more of a struggle with me. And that's why I think some of Roy's, stories are so inspiring to me because because in so many ways he's so tough i think i mean he's dealt a, a tough hand but he's a pretty tough guy well i think the, the thing the thing about that is that uh i'm really all for the individual that's my philosophy of life uh chekhov said the same thing he said i believe in individuals so i'm with chekhov uh, and, you know, I never understood how people could be part of, you know, clubs or political parties or, you know, any of that kind of thing. I mean, a team was something else. I was playing baseball. We needed nine guys on the diamond, and I was very happy to do that. And I grew up as an athlete playing every sport. And, you know, I loved that. And that was all fine. But I didn't want to belong to any organization, like Rajo Mark saying, I didn't want to be a member of any club that would have me as a member. And so I gather that Rajo Marx was an individualist as well. So that's really, you know, all it took. That's my philosophy. And so when, by, by taking off so early, and then I went to Europe when I was 18, you know, I took off, that was it. And that's where basically I start the new book, The Boy Who Ran Away to Sea, which is what my wife, Mary Lou, has often described me as, <laughs> as being, as having been and, and being. And, you know, I just uh, liked the freedom of it. I didn't want anybody to tell me what I had to read, where I had to go, where, you know, where I could sit down, where I couldn't, that sort of thing. So that, that's all. It's a pretty simple answer. You know, I was, you know, and we don't, probably don't have time today to talk about Black Sun Rising, um, which is, is your great uh, Western uh, about the, the Seminoles. But, but I, after I read it, I sat there and I, and I said, and I knew, I knew that about you, uh, the, the belief in the individual. But I said, if there's one group I could see with, it's the Seminoles, because they're a ragtag group of slaves and natives and whites and renegades and outlaws. And I thought, man, if they had starlets, I bet you, I bet you Barry would have joined up. That's right. Uh, that's, that's pretty funny. Well, that book, Black Sun Rising, or La Corazonada, that's coming out in November. And that's a very different kind of book. It's a little, it's an historical novella about the Black Seminoles called Mascogos, who lived in northern Mexico in the 1850s and for a while after that. So it's a completely different thing. It's, uh, it's pretty far from Roy's world. But I'm glad, I'm glad you mentioned it. And yeah, you're right. You know, you're a pretty, pretty perceptive guy, Willie. And I know you have a lot of experiences similar to my own. And I think that's why uh, I appreciate your book so much too, because I understand the sensibility. I understand the point of view, you know, when, you, you know, it's a little different. If you're born into an underclass like that, that's one thing. And you write out of that and about those people so well, and look at you became a great success with, you know, big time movies now done and all these books that can't, the publishers can't wait to publish what you're writing and all. I'm so proud of you. If I never knew you, I would be proud of you. And, and that's sincere. I mean, I really mean it. You're somebody after my own heart, my own philosophy. 
And I, I, I think that there are too few of us in the world, Willie. If there would be more of us, there would be fewer Trumps. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. Um, uh, I, I don't know how we're doing on time as far as questions. Oh, I think well, it's probably... To Chris. Chris is going to come in there with the, you know, the cane to drag us off. Okay. I, it's related to Black Sunrise and, and because at first Black Sunrise it seems uh, uh, really different for you. But then when you read like where Asakola lives and um, which Asiola. is a real, Asiola. Asiola lives and then the Navajo kid in my country in the old west are a few of of your stories because you grew up during a time where westerns were kings and also noir was kings uh, at the movie theaters and although I don't see uh, westerns as much as an influence on you but I do see the noir is is a, is a big influence on on you, maybe not what you're trying to say, but 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 it seems like your stories are all kind of dipped in a in a and it's sort of your own noir. You, was noir noir a, a big influence? Well, I think only in the sense that when I was a, a kid, like I say, I grew up in hotels mostly, and I'd stay up. With, my mother was there, and I'd stay up late at night. TV, you know, old black and white movies in the hotel rooms. And a lot of them were noirs, and I, although I watched every kind of thing, but that world appealed to me because it was chiaroscuro, you know? It was a dark world. It was a world of shadows, uh, indefinable things. You know, I was really interested in what went on in those shadows. So I think that's really what I've kept in my head. And then it, this may sound uh, obtuse in itself, but really it taught me what to leave out of the stories what to leave out in what I was writing. Leave it to the imagination of the reader. Let the reader become involved. Let the reader, you know, bring his or her thought to it, her imagination, you know, and her vision of what these characters look like, uh, that sort of thing. And so, yeah, noir, you know, it's just all part of it. So I loved those movies. Usually it was about people down on their luck and uh, trying to find a way out of it. And sometimes I felt the same way. It seems, uh, I think maybe you, you told me this once that like as a kid, n movies kind of taught you how to tell stories. And Absolutely. Kind of, yeah. I know, where you're, I know you're, where you're going with this. Absolutely, it gave me a sense of structure. Watching movies made me realize how you could tell a story. You know, the beginning, the middle and the end. It sounds simplistic. And uh, it is, but it's not simple. And you have to know when to, how to start, how, you know, how to move your characters around, how to make things happen, when to make them happen. You know, and so yes, watching the movies very much helped develop my sense of narration, of how to tell a story. So it was very, very important. And there's a lot about movies in, in Roy's world and in the Roy stories in general. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, being raised uh, by movies uh, is something I really uh, identify with myself. Uh, the influence of movies to teach you how to write stories. But speaking of your style, and it started when I first jumped on, which is the uh, Wild at Heart, which is the, the two to three page chapter, uh, like the vignette, the complete story in two and a half pages. Um, something that uh, you're brilliant at. How did, did how you've you've kind of stuck with that for years, and it really works for you. How how did you land on that? Is, was it poetry that kind of got you thinking that way, or? Sure, because through writing the poetry, the poems, I learned economy of language. Again, what to leave out, leave out, what was necessary, absolutely necessary, and that's the only thing that can be in it. Um, besides the fact that people were having shorter and shorter attention spans. I think it was Anthony Bourdain who talked about uh, uh, the vignette. You know, he made a very nice comment in the New York Times about just what you're talking about, saying that I was the master of the vignette or something. And I always remembered that compliment because I didn't realize I was writing vignettes, uh, you know. The, the, it's not a word I would have used, but I looked at them all as chapters, not stories. 
And certainly in Roy's world and the Roy stories, uh, that's what they are. They're just chapters. It's just a, a novel, but the structure is not chronological. It's elliptical. So that it doesn't matter, you know, what age Roy is from story to story. Not at all. And or his the characters are, you know, Faulkner did this in his Yachtna Vatafa County, you know, in, in his series of novels where he created times and places that were shifting always. Characters' relations to one another were shifting constantly. Uh, there wasn't a real consistency uh, as far as that went. And I adopted that uh, with the Roy stories. I mean, there is a real sense of uh, that you can read the first one, the middle one, the last one, and all the ones in between in different order. And it's not, like you said, it's not about the order. It's much about the one after another after another and they just start building this world that just kind of takes on its own own life and i think that's what's so uh appealing to them also i want to say they're the they're the kind of stories that if you're on a bus and 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 there's an argument going on and a, a couple weird people d d talking to themselves you can read roy stories through a hurricane or anything it's they're just so simple and amazing and profound and i'm not just saying that because we're buddies but they really are the kind of book that you can read anywhere which to me is is are my favorite books is where where there can be an argument going on next door but but you can still disappear into this whole complete world well you, so you, just, gave, that, you just gave me a new title for a book uh, stories to read stories to read during a hurricane <laughs> I like that one. Listen, we probably don't have a whole lot of time left, but I want to read a story uh, because my granddaughters, uh, uh, Rachelina and Asaya and Amron, they loved this story. And Mary Lou, my wife, read this to them. Uh, it's, it's also from the new book, but it's a little different and it's, it's a little lighter than the ones that I read previously. It, it, it's another short one that can be read during a hurricane. Uh, the title is Revelations. Millie Darling was always the first student in Roy's third grade class to raise her hand to answer a question. When Christopher Columbus sailed from Spain across the Atlantic Ocean and landed in the New World and discovered America, he commanded a fleet of three ships, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. Which one of those ships was Christopher Columbus on? Mrs. McCracken, the teacher, looked at Millie, whose right arm shot up, but did not call on her. Instead, she surveyed the room and called on a girl named Vita Bloom, who rarely volunteered an answer. Vita sat next to Roy in the third row. She was younger than the other kids, having skipped a half grade, short and petite with long black hair and big gray-blue eyes. Roy did not know much about her, other than she, like Roy, was an only child who lived with her mother. Vita stood up and said, Columbus did not discover America. People Europeans called Indians were living here, so it was already discovered, and God knew it was here because he created it, the same as he created everything. When God comes here the next time, you can ask him yourself. Most of the kids laughed. Mrs. McCracken told him to be quiet. Tell us, please, Vita. Do you know when God will be here? My mother told me that God will appear again soon and will answer one question from every person in the world. When he was in Chicago in 1947, nine months before I was born, my mother asked him a question. Only a few of the kids laughed after she said this. What did she ask him? She asked him why he created everything and everybody, all the plants and animals and the mountains, the deserts, good people and bad people, the stars, the sun, the moon, and the insects, especially the insects. My mother is very interested in the lives of insects. Did he answer her? Yes. He told her that he did it because he could, that he began like any artist, which he is, by making marks, then drawing a picture, deciding what to leave in or leave out. He understood that he could create whatever he wanted to, things he'd never seen or even imagined. Did he tell your mother how long it took him to do this? Vita shook her head. No, because that would have been another question, and she, like everyone else, was allowed to ask only one. 
None of the other kids laughed. Mrs. McCracken stared very hard at D Vita. How can she know for certain that God will appear again? I don't know, said Vita, but I do know what ship Christopher Columbus was on. Hey, we have a question. Um, I figured out finally how to. Do, check do I? Yeah, go um, Rob, it's from Rob Christopher, the director uh, of your great documentary. He says, thanks for the kind words. Can you talk about your story, the delivery, about what when you were working as a delivery boy for a Chinese restaurant, and also your experience of having Harry Dean Stanton perform a version of that story in David Lynch's hotel room? Uh, hotel Room was one of three plays uh, I wrote uh, that Lynch was set to direct. We did a TV show for HBO called uh, Hotel Room. And there's a book called Hotel Room Trilogy. Uh, but we wound up only doing two of them for the Hotel Room show. And the first one was this story, The Delivery, which is one of the Roy stories, basically, which I adapted uh, for uh, HBO. Harry Dean is the perfect actor for me. I, I knew Harry and uh, he's a good friend of David's and we became friendly on the set of Wild at Heart. But anyway, for him to deliver that little speech that he does in the story, the delivery is, it's wonderful. It, it, it's a pathetic character. He delivers it pathetically you know, with the right amount of pathos, not bathos. And uh, it, it almost made me cry because there are very few times in life, in an artist's life, in a writer's life, you know, where you really see something enacted in that way. And it's right, it's real, it's, it's what it was. And in fact, uh, that's something taken more or less from real life when I was delivering. And I remember it was raining, it was snowing, it was a terrible day and I'm riding my bicycle and I get to this woman's house and the bags of Chinese food are leaking and soaked and all of that kind of thing. And this woman answers the door in negligee with her tits half falling out and you know, she's got a lot of makeup on and she's kind of a little too old for this. And I'm 12 years old or 11 years old, you know, and it, just to kind of make a long story short, I give her the food, she takes it. There's no complaints about the condition of the bags or anything like that. And she gives Roy a $20 bill. And she says, keep the change. So in those days, which would have been about, you know, what, 1958, or something like that, 20 bucks was a lot of money. And to a kid who's making 25 cents an hour in a dime of delivery, that's Valhalla. You know, and he goes outside and he's standing there in the rain and the snow, and he thinks to himself, if I could only have one delivery like this a day, just one. And if anybody gets a chance, I think hotel room uh, and, and, you know, that play, is part of it is on YouTube. So just go to YouTube, look up the hotel, hell room, hotel room show that Lynch and I did. And it's Harry Dean Stanton all the way, man. He did it just right, you know, absolutely right. How many things go absolutely right in anybody's life? You know, when I was uh, uh, in my 20s, people would ask me like, so who's your dad? And I'd say, Harry Dean Stanton. Because I, <laughs> <laughs> I liked him so much in Repo Man. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. My daughter Phoebe's one of her favorite movies. Yeah. Um, so I think this is question time. If anyone has it, I think I figured it out. How to uh, get questions. Or, my, or I might need some help from Chris uh, if he's around. Because I'm not the most savvy. Okay, I think that's it, man. I don't see any questions, unless Chris comes up. No, but people can see this on YouTube later, you know, yeah. wherever. That's it. Yeah. No, Rob, Rob, Rob asked the best question. Yeah. 
Awesome. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it was amazing. Uh, it was an honor to hear you talk about life and writing. I say Lost Highway and Wild at Heart are two of my favorite movies of all time. I'm def I'm going to go watch Hotel Room now. Uh, I don't know why I haven't seen that yet. Yeah, me too. Oh, that's <laughs> great. That's uh, great. Everybody, please, please buy a copy of Roy's World. Uh, we've got the link uh, in the chat. And uh, thank you so much to, to Willie and, uh, and Barry and, and Rob, too. If you've missed any of the event, uh, like Willie said, it'll, it'll be on YouTube very soon. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Chris. And thank you, Willie. We'll be talking soon, brother. Yeah, great to see you, Barry. Bye. Take care, man. Kiss Lee for me. Oh, I will. I will. Thank you. Okay, man. Bye.